This circuit board here is quite exciting. Uh, it's the CPU uh, board from a PDP-1124. Uh, that was a line of mini computers produced by uh, DEC in the uh, from the 1970s to uh, just before 2000. And uh, this is a really great example of uh, technology just uh, about 1979, 1980. Uh, at the time this particular mini computer was being produced, uh, there was two iconic microcomputer chips being produced. The uh, 68000, of course, which made it into the Macintosh and the 8-bit variation of the 8086, which uh, made the course into the IBM PC. Uh, this com company here was, of course, producing far superior computers at the time, but uh, the mini computers were coming, basically, and, and this uh, company uh, was struggled because of that, and eventually we went into business. Let's uh, see what we have on this board. It's obviously a very large circuit board. It has a Unibus, they call it here. You can see no memory on it, because to use this computer board, you'd have to put a memory card on, and then, of course, some tape drives and such not to create a full computer. You can see though some custom silicon here from the uh, deck. Let's zoom into the section first and then take an analysis of some of the interesting chips we can see over here. So by the late 70s computer makers were moving into large-scale integration for their uh, CPU sections and a uh, deck was no uh, different. You can see though that they needed five chips to get everything going plus of course a tremendous amount of support logic. Uh, this here is a 304E, that's the uh, memory management chip. Um, this computer, I'm pretty sure, could run uh, Unix. Uh, it, it was one of the very uh, smallest computers that are capable of doing so. Uh, this one here is marked the 302. That's the data chip. Uh, and then, of course, you get three chips marked 303, 1, 2, 3. Uh, this one's known as the uh, control chip. It's a large ROM PLA, which uh, formed the micro-coded instruction set. And you can see it looks like there was slots for even more of these up here, so you could actually get more instructions. Uh, I think this board here has the option for the floating point. This chip here... Uh, well, pardon me, these two chips here provided what was required to uh, do floating point instructions. Now, the other thing, of course, you really note is uh, these look like surface mount packages, and they're, of course, into a, a DIP40. That was pretty typical. Uh, manufacturers, of course, had their lines all set up for through-hole technology. And when things like uh, surface mount were coming in, of course, uh, they weren't quite ready for it all the way through their infrastructure. So you'd see these um, very expensive packages, basically, of a, a ceramic carrier, and then through ceramic chips on top of that. So... You can see basically the industry was just on the verge of a, a transition. Let's take a look at uh, one of these uh, PLA or the microcode chips. Um, I'll get a hot air gun out and um, first uh, desolder the uh, surface mount package from its uh, dip carrier. Looks like the solder that was used to attach it has a lower melting point than the lid. Uh, then I just put it into this uh, small vise here and a ceramic tile below so I don't burn my bench. And um, a tremendous amount of heat. Uh, the soldering uh, that was used was obviously a fairly high temperature. Uh, in its composition, because it took a tremendous amount of heat to actually get this lid knocked off. But uh, well, once I did so, I was, of course, uh, able to see the actual integrated circuit below. Let, uh, let me insert a macro photograph of the actual array. Uh, and you can see, indeed, look, there's three areas that are regular in the middle there. There's some uh, driver logic to the right. And uh, this is, of course, very typical of some sort of memory-type construct. Um, interestingly enough, though, if I zoom into the center here, it looks like the array is still quite regular. Um, if this was a ROM, of course, the microcode should show up as a, a series of fuses uh, with different patterns. So um, I wonder if I'm looking at something which actually could be reprogrammed uh, dynamically. I'm honestly not sure, actually. I'm not sure if the microcode was fixed on these machines or it could be loaded at will. So certainly some uh, microcoded machines uh, could be reconfigured in the field to uh, anything you'd like. Not sure. I wonder if there's any deck experts out there. I'd love to hear from you. What else can we see on this chip? Of course, here we have the mark uh, DEC uh, 303, confirming, of course, the part. Uh, we have a mass copy rate of 1979, so consistent with that sort of late 70s uh, design heritage. And uh, very typical, this, I believe, is a 6 micrometer chip, so uh, stated there at the time, and of course, um, these features uh, are really super visible even under just simply a, a microscope. Uh, the other two chips, I think I'll save those for uh, some other videos, but uh, let's carry on here and take a look at the other parts you can see on this board. So this is a, a four-layer circuit board. You can see they run two traces between each uh, dip package, and of course in that era, uh, that would be pretty state-of-the-art. Um, you can also see a lot of uh, wires here. Now, this isn't a prototype board. This is a full production unit, I suspect, uh, but it wasn't unusual uh, back then. A simulation of the computers was still fairly tricky to do. And it wasn't uncommon to see mistakes on circuit boards requiring uh, hand modifications of wires. Uh, this, again, was going into a very expensive market, uh, the mini-computer market. Uh, the cost structure was quite high. 
uh, and you could actually justify building boards with uh, wires and uh, it was actually too expensive to uh, change the artwork quickly it was actually faster to put wire mods in the production floor and of course that would all rapidly be disappearing as computers are driven down dramatically in cost uh, up here it looks like there's a couple of serial ports these are uh, journal instruments uh, ay5 1013s i believe it was one serial port each and then up here in smc 5016 this is a uh, dual baud rate generator uh, all these of course long obsolete parts but you can sort of see the amount of real estate required just for the uh, serial portion of the uh, circuit board some uh, sn74276 so these are i think quad jk flip-flops and uh don't see too many jk flip-flops in designs anymore up here a part with a proprietary number texas instrument uh, deck uh, 2501 some of these might be quite interesting to actually decap uh, just to, to see what's going on much more common 74 ls 164 you can certainly find a data sheet for that still 123 buffer if i recall correctly it's been a long time since i uh, did 7400 series that uh, design um you can see of course all the date codes coming in the 80s here so it was probably a uh, early probably late 1970s design of course and uh was in production for a little bit and uh it's just a festival of old companies and of course um, all sorts of uh, just basic parts that we had uh, usually a couple dozen uh, four to five uh, gates maybe uh, certainly a uh, very low integration here this is an 8-bit uh, buffer if i recall um, 175 uh, this one's a uh, quad d flip-flop here's an interesting trip here it shows up all over the assembly mc8641 I looked extensively on the web and couldn't find any data sheet for it. Um, it seems to be associated close with the Unibus, so I'm not sure if it was a proprietary part uh, that was made just for um, the deck and they used it there, but I can't find absolutely any data on it. If someone knows what the 8641 is or some of a collection of really old data sheets, I certainly wouldn't mind uh, seeing that. Uh, here is again, coming back to that little programmable uh, logic array. Uh, those are NANs, if I recall correctly. That's a uh, NOR gate. 32 is the NOR. Uh, LM339, a quad differential uh, op amp. So interesting, even some very analog circuitry here on this part here. Looks like there's the uh, associated components going up here. 240, an 8-bit buffer, if I recall. Uh, 174 is a flip-flop of some sort. Um, 175, similar. Uh, an AMD part, uh, part number unfortunately obscured, so you can't really tell what it is. Coming back to the LSI chipset. Um, Again, more of these probably proprietary parts. I don't think that would trace to any... Oh, pardon me. 74. Uh, definitely find a data sheet for that. Another National Semiconductor uh, OR gate. Uh, perhaps a NOR gate. Uh, 248-bit. Uh, here's that mysterious MC6800 again. Um, another uh, National Semiconductor part. Uh, let's see. That's a DS8640. You really get the sense that the uh, integration portion of this board is really, really uh, thin. That's a quad NOR gate, apparently. Um, yeah. Here is a National Semiconductor dual differential line receiver. Um, sort of a high speed component, or at least high speed for that era. This is, of course, the Unibus connector uh, that was uh, well defined in their architecture. Uh, I suspect that's a resistor array. CTS, an old line uh, vendor of resistors. Not sure if they're still in business or not. Uh, you can see some uh, tantalum capacitors. Uh, dip switches, of course, this is the bane of a lot of computers. You had so much uh, customization. You can flip dip switches and get yourself in all sorts of trouble. And uh, you spend lots of time debugging them. If you look at a modern computer, you'll never see a dip switch in it. They were sort of aggressively designed out because uh, of all the troubles they cause in terms of trying to get a computer to be set up correctly. Let's see, this is a National Semiconductor part, uh, 74LS169, comes in as a 4-bit up-down binary counter. This is a, a Texas Instruments, uh, looks like it's a flip-flop, uh, JK flip-flops, don't see those used too often. Uh, capacitor here, that might be a tantalum. Uh, here, of course, you can see more of those wires with uh, design uh, changes on them. Uh, lots of, uh, surprising lots of wire actually on this board, but... Um, Again, not too unusual in that era. It was very hard to simulate uh, all these uh, discrete components with computers. This is an 8-bit uh, serial shift register, it looks like. It's a Heck Schmidt trigger inverters. Uh, some more discrete components. Uh, 
The surprising amount of analog circuitry on this one, this is obviously a potentiometer for adjusting a voltage, I presume, one of those multi-turn ones with the um, little dab of uh, paint on it so it doesn't shift in value once they shift it, uh, once they sell it. Uh, those are D flip-flops, if I recall, a Fairchild Semiconductor, uh, all these old line companies. Oh, what else can we see? Uh, this here is a very early programmable logic array. It's a, a fuse programmable array from Signetics. And uh, what it allowed to do was, uh, rather than put down the 7400 series TTL you see it's surrounded by, you get better density by buying one of these chips and programming it. So a very early example of programmable logic. Well, there we go, a little snippet of computer history. I'll put up a detailed photograph of the board plus that micro photograph of the PLA on my blog, electronupdate.blogspot.com. And I don't think I'm finished with this board. There's obviously some really old semiconductors well worth investigating and taking photographs of. So hopefully uh, some future episodes here, I'll start taking a look at some of the other silicon that we saw on this board.